everyone. Welcome to Parks Eyed at Home. We are so happy to have you. My name is Kayla. And I'm Callie. We are just super, super excited for you guys to be here. Yeah, if this is your first time, we would love to get to know you a little bit better. You can go to parkside.life slash connect. You can just fill out a little bit of your information. I promise we're not going to call you all the time or email you all the time. We just want to say thanks so much for being here. Yeah, and we would love to be able to connect with you and get to know you a little bit better that way. So our vision here at Parkside is to inspire bridge builders to live and to love like Jesus. Um, and a part of that is knowing that sometimes people struggle with things. Um, so we know that life can be a lot right now, especially with the yeah, holidays. So life much. is cr- absolutely crazy. Um, and whether you are trying to navigate work or finances or maybe just some stuff that's going on with family, um, that can be a really heavy weight for people to carry. Yeah. And so the whole reason that we're here is to provide you guys with an opportunity um, to learn more about who Jesus is and then what living in a life with relationship with him can actually look like. Yes. Yeah, so no matter where you're watching from, no matter what's going on in this season of life, we believe that you are here today because God has something that he wants to share with you. Absolutely. Um, So during this time, we definitely encourage you guys, lean into him and lean into what he's trying to tell you. Really hear from God. Um, So listen to how he is speaking to you and then ask how you can apply that truth to your life. Yeah, so we just want to know, we just want to remind you that you are not alone, that we are here with you and for you. Absolutely. We would love to know how God is moving and working in Mm -hmm. your life. So feel free to comment or message us, anything Mm -hmm. like that. Uh, Because we just, we would love to encourage and pray with you. Yep. And another way that we would like to encourage you guys is to just thank you. We thank you so much for the generosity that you guys have shown um, to our church family, your church family, because you guys are definitely a part of Parkside. Um, And so again, we just thank you so, so much. Um, Your generosity definitely helps us to make an impact every single week. um, And that just means the absolute world to us. Yeah, so if you would, excuse me, if you would like to worship through giving, you can go online to parkside.life slash give. This is a safe and secure way to partner with how God is building bridges. Yep. So that is all of the announcements that we have for you guys. It is time to get into our message. We're so excited. We're in week three of our Ephesians series. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're here, we would love to know. Comment, say hi, like the message, or like the video, anything like that. We would just love to know that you're watching. Yeah, so again, thanks for being here, and we hope that you guys love the message. Good morning, church. I think, uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, when the weather really starts to turn cold, you know, like yesterday, Um, I was asking Siri about the weather for today, and she said the low was 32, and I was like, "Uh, excuse me, I don't think so. That's not what we agreed upon. Uh, Even though I spent uh, nine years living in Indiana, it did not take me long to to reacclimate to southern weather and being a a fan of that. Like, I don't mind the snow, and I know that that's going to come for us for about 24 hours a couple times. Uh, but I don't miss the cold weather, so I always brace uh, for the cold weather. So uh, it, it makes me, uh, it makes things a little bit more difficult to get going in the morning. So maybe that's you this morning. But I'm excited to continue this conversation that we're having uh, through the book of Ephesians. And if you're joining us online, we want to thank you so much for doing that. And we're excited that you can connect with us in this way, uh, diving into a book of the Bible, a book that was written to a church, which is really cool because we're a church, and the things that were written so long ago are still absolutely positively relevant to us today. And as I've spent time thinking about the things that we're talking about these few weeks, I have found myself with a lot of moments of reflection. And, And it could be a combination of a couple different things, and I think this is true. One of them uh, is there's been a lot of milestones that, that have happened in Deborah and I's life uh, personally and uh, you know, with the church and ministry-wise over the last couple of years, uh, our daughter uh, hit double digits, which is kind of a big deal. Uh, nine and ten were different, and like uh, nine was harder for me because it was like she's halfway to 18, and that's kind of like that line of demarcation of when like a lot of times in-home parenting is done, uh, and also like holding very two different emotions in my hand like... I am excited for her to be gone and for it just to be Deborah and I again at some point, you know, like 
back to when it was just us. Uh, and then there's also the part of me that like never wants her to leave ever. You know, it's really odd. Um, and then 10 was weird because like she's 10. She's in fifth grade. This is the last year of elementary school. So that's weird. Deborah and I celebrate 15 years of marriage this coming week, which is just wild to think about that she's put up with me for 15 consecutive years. Uh, and we had a conversation. I don't know if you're married, maybe you're like this too, like where you lay in bed at night and like everything's quiet down and you're kind of just staring at the ceiling and you're having a conversation. And we had this conversation. Um, this has obviously been the longest relationship we've ever had. And if you add up all the relationships that each of us had previous and I had a lot more than she did because I had some really less than holy days in my life for sure. Um, and if we stack all those relationships on top, like, we still beat that total by a lot being married. It's just weird. And then obviously Parkside Church launching and turning one years old here just a few weeks ago. A lot of milestones in our lives and it's just gotten me in this season where I'm all in my feels, right? And I'm reflecting on a lot of different things. And this past week, my mind turned to a season in my life that I don't necessarily love to talk about a ton. Uh, my freshman year of high school was a really weird time in my life. Uh, when I kind of jokingly referenced my less than holy days, that's probably the peak of the time in my life where I was doing things that were really, really outside of what God wanted for me. Things were not going well at school. In fact, I, I joke, I have joked over the years that, you know, I referenced that time in my life by my first freshman year and my second freshman year because things were going so poorly I had to repeat my freshman year. Now, thankfully, through the grace of God, and I feel like I have to tell you this so I don't sound like a complete failure, even though I was, that I was able to graduate on time. But that was some really difficult times. At school, was, things were not going great. At home, things were not going well. And I'll just be honest, that was a season of my life where I really did not like who I'd become. And I think on the outside, people saw someone who had confidence and was maybe a little too confident in himself at times. But I think in my heart of hearts, when I look back on that time, I really did not like who I'd become. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that who I said I was, the image that I presented to other people, and who I was when no one else was looking, they were really incongruent. And I think I did more to hurt the gospel as a young believer than I did to help the gospel. And I've struggled with that for a lot of times. Like, I'm not a person that lives with a ton of regrets, but that's definitely a season of my life where I look back and say, I made a lot of wrong decisions. And I think i beginning to understand now the difference between being a believer, and I absolutely believed in the Lord. I went to church all the time. I was a leader in my youth group, and I had, at an early age before that, professed the desire to be involved in working with and for a church as my career, as my profession. But I lived life as a believer, but not as a disciple. I didn't let the things that I believed and the things that I told people I believe actually impact my life. And that summer after my freshman year, I remember very clearly deciding, because the Lord was whispering to my heart during that time. I can't tell you. It was at a camp, right? I grew up going to camp, and it was at a camp. I don't remember who was speaking. I don't remember the topic of the conversation, but I remember very clearly the Lord kind of whispering to my heart, it's time to make a change. And that's when the idea of pursuing Jesus as a determination of my heart, like a, a choice that I make through a series of choices every day, being something that was a part of my life as opposed to kind of falling into spiritual discipline or falling into a relationship with Jesus. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, about making that transition from just falling into a relationship with Jesus by casually attending church or saying that we believe certain things to actually making a determination of our heart a series of choices that result in the choice to pursue Jesus. That summer, things changed forever for me, but it wasn't an arrival. I want to make that very clear because I don't know that there are arrival points when it comes to our spiritual lives, our relationship with Christ. We're kind of in process, and, and we kind of get to milestones and, and things that, that, that were a part of our lives that aren't a part of our lives as far as sin and things like that, and things that weren't a part of our lives that now are a part of our lives as far as spiritual disciplines and things like that. 
but to start moving in that direction from becoming a believer to actually being a disciple is an important move to make. And I think it's all about what we've been talking about, this transition from old life to new life. How do we get there? What does that look like? And I think to some degree we're all in that process. Maybe you can point back to that moment where you felt like the Lord said, hey, it's time for some things to change. It's time to actually get serious about this thing that you say that you believe in. Or maybe you're in that season right now where you're hearing God whisper to you, hey, you know, like it's time to take a next step where he's calling us into deeper relationship with him. When you realize that, that that relationship, like it's not just about the climate of the life around you, the world around you, it's actually about climate change within you, right? There's a big difference between that. But no matter where we are in that continuum, what we're discovering through our study of the book of, of Ephesians is very timely. I, that's one thing that's really surprised me, and I don't know why it should, because, because God kind of does this all the time, that that. He shows up and teaches us things exactly when we need to hear them, exactly when he's helped prepare our hearts uh, to to receive new truth. And I think in Paul's teaching, he's been giving us a blueprint to making the transition from old life to new life. And what's really interesting about that is that if you look at the study that we've done so far, like we've kind of gone through the different chapters, and now we're kind of around chapter 5. We've jumped around a little bit, but we're in chapter 5. He, over the time, he's gone from these really big concepts, and he's beginning to narrow those things down. We talked about our identity in Christ, the foundation of who we are. And then we, we kind of talked about unity as believers and the power and impact that that can have in our world. And now we're starting to funnel down, we're starting to drill down a little bit deeper. And Paul's giving us some pretty specific instructions on how believers should live. And that's where we're going to spend a lot of our time today. He, he narrows his focus, his focus as, we, um, as we go along. And as Paul's drilling down these things, he teaches us something that I think is really important. This is kind of our, one of our main ideas for today. If you're taking notes, maybe write this down. He's teaching us that our new life that we've been given shouldn't look like the old one. If you were here last week, that's something Deborah said specifically, that our old life should not look like the new one. And I think it's really easy for us to look through the rest of chapter 5 and see all these examples that he gives. And it's, it's easy to create a, a checklist, a, a to-do list or a to-don't list. Do this and don't do that. But the question I keep coming back to is what if Paul isn't creating a checklist? What if it's not, not meant to be a thing that we kind of look at and say, well, this is a part of my life and this isn't a part of my life. I'm not saying we shouldn't look at these things. They're important. But what's the heart behind them? What is Paul trying to communicate through what he's trying to communicate? And I think if we keep in mind that Paul's teaching as a whole, if we look at it as a whole, not even just in Ephesians, is about pointing us away from religion, right? The practice of doing spiritual things. What if he's actually pointing us to things that we can do to strengthen a relationship with Jesus? And if we look at it through that lens, how can we take these specific items and apply them to our lives at a greater context, a place from our heart, not just a place of our hands doing things just to be doing things? What if we could learn this? How do we apply these things to our life, impact my relationship, not just prove that I'm religious? And I think if we, we look at Ephesians 5, 8, it, it can help frame our thinking. And it says this, for you were once in darkness, but now you are, excuse me, you are now, did I write that down right? Sorry, guys. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. That gives us this context, this framework that our life should not look like it used to. But maybe it means this. Living out our identity in Christ takes intentional living. Living out our relationship with Christ, it takes an intentional living. I kind of referenced this before, even in my own life, but we don't just fall into a relationship with Christ. We don't just fall into living out spiritual disciplines. We don't just fall into discipleship. I I think sometimes we treat Christianity like this, like faith like this, like, hey, we'll go in with a 30-day trial, and if we're still doing good after 30 days, then boom, you're a disciple. Boom, you've fallen into what it means to be a Christian, and it doesn't work like that. 
living a life that honors the new life that we've been giving only comes through deliberate choices. I've been, um, over the last few months, I've had the opportunity to visit with a counselor, which has been really good. I, I've told some of you guys this before, that back in 2018, I think it was, I had a little bit of health scare, spent a few uh, days in a hospital, had a couple of heart procedures. It was a crazy time, uh, and, and that was a scary moment in our lives, but one thing that really surprised me afterwards was months and months and months of anxiety about my health, that going around thinking that at any moment, like, something could happen, and I could end up back in the hospital, and some of those thoughts turn pretty dark, where it's like, at any moment, I could just drop dead. And I struggled with that to the point where it finally got to the arrival point where it's like, I need some help with this. And I, I met with my counselor this week, and, and it's been a really helpful, and one of the things that he uh, shared with me through this process that really struck me as, as odd the way that we process faith, especially if you grow up in church, so much of what we experience about God is information. Think about it. Like, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a, in a small, more traditional church. I spent every Sunday morning from about 9 to 10 in Sunday school, right? And I remember back in the day in elementary school, they pulled up those felt boards, and they told me about Peter, and they told me about Mo, and they used those little felt boards to, to kind of illustrate the stories before we had things like DVDs that are just in church, and how the kids over there are learning their lesson through an Apple TV, which is, you know, technology is amazing. But I think we should bring back the flannel graphs. Maybe next week, well, that's what we'll do, is we'll teach the lesson through flannel graph. It'll be great. But, but that's how we learn about God so much. It's just information. And even in this context, in this format, it's a lot of information. But right, when we make this transition that we're talking about here, it becomes about experience. Relationships aren't built on information. They're built on experience. And how can we actually experience God? And so much of that for our part is about deliberate choice. Making the choice to do and be with God. And I think Paul teaches the church way back then, and it applies to us now, this truth. And it starts in Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to start with verse 15. And we're going to dive deep into the scripture and see how it applies to our life. And it starts here. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Making most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, which is just a fun word. Uh, instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit, singing to make music of your heart, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I remember uh, when I started my preparation for this message and I started diving into the scripture, I struggled. I was like, how in the world? Like, there's so much here. Like, what are we going to draw out? And I got lost in some things I think we can get lost in as believers. We look at these very specific things and we say, what about this? What do we do to look at this? But I think if we elevate just a little bit, like if we look at it from a higher view and try to get to what Paul is actually saying here, we can find the heart of the matter. What is he actually saying here? I think as he continues, this directive is all about intentional living. It's not just about these things that he lists out here. And we're going to talk about those a little bit. And these are good things to look at. But looking at it from a 30,000 foot view, I think he begins a cut, to cut a path towards intentional living in two ways. And I think the first one is this. I think Paul and God, by extension, is calling us to be intentional with our time. To be intentional with our time. And it starts with verse 16. And I think if we go back to first time, like we go back to 15 and we understand, be careful, right? That, that's all about intention. Be careful how we live. That speaks to intentionality. So if we take that and bring it down to verse 16, it says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like I said, these are really good things to evaluate, but it's not just a checklist to look at. 
How do we understand? Essentially what Paul is saying here is that we should use the time that we have wisely. I think it's easy to look at this and, and basically say the, the, the crux of these few verses is this. Don't get drunk and sing some songs, right? And like there's some truth that we can dig out there, but I don't want to spend our time here debating the merits of, of alcohol and faith. And, and, and for someone who is not a singer, like diving into like when the word calls us to sing, like it, it, we have to go a little bit deeper because that's not something we necessarily enjoy doing because we know that people don't enjoy us doing that, right? Right? Nobody wants me singing. But I think when we look at this from an elevated view, that the, the spirit is the time that you've been given, use it wisely. And I remember pulling back from the seat that I was sitting in at Maple Street when, I, when I'm, you know, engaging the scripture and trying to figure out exactly what God is saying. And I had to really make sure that I understood what God was saying to me in that moment. Because here's where my mind went. Because my mind thinks in terms of efficiency. And when I hear honor God with your time, my mind automatically goes to this productivity, this corporate view of what it means to use our time well. My mind starts thinking about time management. And I don't think this is at all what Paul is talking about here. He's not, he's not talking about using your time wisely in the sense of productivity. I think it's a larger view. Not just the how we spend our hours, it's really about how we spend our days. How we use the life that we've been given. One of the things that we don't like to talk about uh, and it's not particularly not fun for me to talk about this today, but we don't know how much time we have on this earth. And the reason that's not easy for me to talk about today is because one of my former students that actually Matt and Hannah and Deborah and I shared in Indiana lost his life at 20 years old this, just a couple of days ago. And it's been really difficult to think about that. And it's also like really difficult to talk about that or in process that in the midst of celebrating a new family coming together with Paige and Kennedy's wedding yesterday. Like, it was really weird to like be present and be excited for someone starting this incredible journey together, but also like in these quiet moments, like wanting to be in Indiana and be with these students that we love so much as they mourn the loss of a lifelong friend. But it does remind me, like, we just don't know how much, we t- how t- how much time we have on this earth, and I hope that we're all blessed with this long, beautiful life, but the reality is we all know someone who was lost way too soon. And I don't want to focus on like how I'm managing my time and these little minute things, but I want to think about how I'm using my life that God has given me. And when Paul says something like, don't drink too much wine because it leads to debauchery, what he's saying is, don't waste your life. Instead, live life in the Spirit. Live life in things that matter, in purpose and in meaning, things that are going to add fulfillment to not just your life, but everyone's life. As believers, as a step further than that, as disciples, like our life is not just meant for ourselves. It's meant to add purpose and value and meaning to the lives around us. It's an uncomfortable truth to wrestle with sometimes, but our days are numbered, and we don't know how many we have. I mean, it's pretty clear in James chapter 4 when it says, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will do this, or we will go to this city and spend a year there, carry on a business and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while, and then it vanishes. That's not one of the most encouraging verses in the Bible, right? (laughs) James kind of like is very to the point. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. I think sometimes it's easy to look at that and ask about significance. And that's not the point. The point is whatever time we have can be significant if we are intentional. I know a 25-year-old girl who passed away from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and her life has had more of an impact just living 25 years than mine ever will. I know people who have lived their life uh, away from the Lord and then got things situated at the end of their life, and their life had more impact in the last few months of their life than all the years before combined. I'm not saying that's the goal here. I'm saying is 
Our life can have meaning and impact at any point, but it takes deliberate choice. I don't know how much time you've been given, but you should make it count. Paul says, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And then he goes through this list that we should not get lost in. It's about making the most of the time that we've been given. Don't waste your life. Instead, be used, use it to be filled with the Spirit, living in a way that honors the life that you've been given. Because it was God who gave us life. And the best choice that we can make is to live intentionally. The other way that Paul reminds us to live intentionally is to honor God with our relationships. I mean, arguably the second greatest gift that God gave us, aside from salvation, the opportunity to live with him forever, is relationships. I mean, even people who are introverted or or prefer a very small group of people, consider themselves loners, like everybody lives in relationships. I'm watching this movie right now uh, on Apple TV Plus called Finch, and it's Tom Hanks plays this character. It's kind of this post-apocalyptic kind of deal, which is kind of my favorite movie. I don't know kind of movie. I don't know why. But uh, he's this guy who desperately avoids other people because they're dangerous and they're scary and they hurt people. But he spends this incredible amount of time creating this robot that's, you know, it's sentient and it's all this kind of thing. It's like even this person that's avoiding people at all costs, it created this robot so he wasn't alone. I think it's, it's a really silly example, but it's very true to life that even people who say they want to be alone and left alone, they still crave relationships. And in Ephesians 5.21, in nine little words, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Just nine words, but they pack a punch. There's a lot in these nine little words, and I think the first one is the one that we struggle with the absolute most. Submit. I know I struggle with that word. As someone who likes to be independent, who likes to get their own way, I can admit that. I'm a recovering like, person that struggles with this, right? But I think the reason we struggle with that word is because we have the definition incorrect. I think when we think submit, we think servitude. And not serving people, but we think like being under someone else's rule. And especially for Americans, we hate this idea. I mean, if the last two years has taught us anything, especially in the region that we live in, we don't like to be told what to do. But what if submission wasn't about servitude? It was about agreeing mutually together as a collective to carry one another's burdens. What if we looked at that word in that context in light of this? Submit to one another in reverence to Christ. What if we carried each other's burdens in reverence to Christ? Made that intentional choice. This voluntary caring of each other's burden. About purposely purposely making the choice to put others' needs ahead of our own. And this is not the first and only time, by a long shot, that Scripture calls us to this. It says in Philippians chapter 2, Do nothing, nothing, out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. And Jesus' mindset was this. I have come to serve, not be served. That is the mindset of Christ that we're being called to in this moment, to put others' needs ahead of our own. But here's where I'm going to let you off the hook just a little bit. Not off the hook so much that you could ignore what we're talking about here, but an understanding. Because I think the thing that we struggle with is is some of us, a small percentage of us, there's this arrogance about us that I'm going to take care of me. I'm going to meet my needs first because I'm most important. I think there's actually very few people who actually live that way. They may come off that way, but I think for most of us, the thing that we get hung up on when it comes to submitting to other people is fear of getting hurt. If I don't take care of my needs, no one else will. 
And the, the perfect scenario is that if we are all submitting to one another, then all our needs are going to be met in abundance, right? In abundance. Because if you've ever been in a situation where it's like you're struggling and someone actually comes and helps you, and it's like it's above and beyond. Like sometimes I'm known for picking on people in bad ways in this setting. I'm going to pick on someone in a good way. When Deborah and I had COVID, Mark showed up to our house with chicken soup, and it was amazing. And like... Did I need to eat in that moment? Absolutely. But I was going to, like, mosey downstairs. I'm not going to mosey because I was really sick. Like, I'm going to, like, try not to fall down the stairs and be out of breath. And I'm going to make whatever's easiest to make. But someone showed up to my house, and this is a very marked thing to do, with a Ziploc bag full of soup. <laughs> and it was amazing. And it, it touched, it, like, touched our soul, didn't it, Deb? Like, I mean, it was really good. And this is an example of someone submitting in reverence to Christ, and my need was met, but it wasn't just a physical need, I need food. It, it touched my soul. That's such a small thing, but it made a tremendous impact, the fact that we're talking about it month, almost a year later. That's what it looks like to submit to one another. And I know fear that we'll get taken advantage of can take over, but when we are living on, when God honoring submission to one another, treating others with respect, then all our needs are met and God is honored. But sometimes the system breaks down. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. And what do we do when people don't keep up their end of the bargain? Because it happens. We've all experienced that. And my skeptical mind goes there quite a bit. When I don't want to submit to other people because I'm like, if I, I got to take care of me. That's when the Lord asked me this question. Can you name one time, one time when you've been faithful to me that I haven't been faithful to you? Maybe, maybe your guard goes up in this moment when you, when you think about putting yourself out there and, and not sure how that's going to be reciprocated. Like that you're going to actually put your needs aside to, to care for someone else and that leaves you vulnerable. And you're like, I just don't know if I can do that. Can you name one time that you were faithful to God that he wasn't faithful to you? I can. And that's when I remember this. We're spending all this time talking about God, us honoring God. But I had this moment where I was thinking through these things, and I remember that God honors me. I mean, think about that for a second. Like, God honors you. Like, the reason we honor God is it's a reciprocation of this, um, this amazing things that he's done for us over and over again. The very life that we have, not just the breath that we have, but this opportunity we have to have life with him eternal. Like, of course I'm going to honor him for that because it's amazing and I couldn't do it on my own. If it was up to me, I would be dead in a ditch somewhere. But even though we can't at all compare to what, what we can do for God that he does for us, but he still honors me. He still honors you. And this whole conversation has been about discovering how we can honor Jesus for this new life through intentional living. But I think some of us, we need to be reminded that he honors us as well. He honors us with purpose and with meaning, with relationships, with comfort, with gifts and abilities, with creativity, with resources. The list can go on and on. And one of those ways is we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity. Just, just a quick second, because we're, we're a little over, but it always blows my mind that, that the, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross, wasn't, it really wasn't about giving us eternal life. I think we have to remove it a, a layer and, and put something in its place. It's about the choice. It's about the opportunity, because he didn't force it on us. And for me, like adding that extra layer to say that Jesus died on the cross was so that I could have a choice to choose or reject him, it makes me love him anymore because it makes the sacrifice that much more special because he did it knowing that some people would choose not to. He honors you. We've been called to live this life, but it's not just in homage to a king. He is that. He absolutely is that. But it's not just about homage to a king. It's just not about loyalty. It's about intimate connection to an ever-present father that just wants the best for you. 
And he wants to give you these life-changing moments that, that, that are not just about him. They do give him glory, but it's about us having this best possible life in the here and the later. And honoring him with intentional living is the best response to how he honors us. So as we end our time together, my challenge to you is, what are you going to do this week? And like, we try to be very careful to talk about the difference between doing and being, because religion is about doing. If I do this, and this, and this, and this, and I don't do this, this, and this, then, then I am closer to God. But how do we tie in the being to doing? How do we start from that place that, that I am a child of the king, I am a disciple, therefore I'm going to make intentional choices that honors the things that God has done for me? That, that, that piece is very important. But what are you going to do this week to make intentional choice to honor God with your time? Does that mean there's some things that you're doing with your time that, that you know aren't productive or fruitful, that don't honor him, that, that, that create separation? That I'm just not, not going to do those things this week. Or I'm going to choose to live in the Spirit by spending some time in the Word to feel more connected to Him. To not just get information, but have an experience. Am, am I going to live life in a relationship by serving one another and honor God in my relationships around me? That is the transition between old life and new life. And that's exactly what Paul's after. That's what God is trying to teach us through the words of Paul in Ephesians and really throughout the Bible. So what are you going to do this week to live more intentionally? Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you so much for the time that we have to, to not just hear about you, but learn from you. And not just get more information or more knowledge, but to experience you. And Lord, I, I can't peer into everyone's heart in this moment, but I pray for those who are, who are in the midst of that transition from old life to new life, that you're at that point where you're, you're whispering to them, like, it's time for a change. It's time to do something different. I pray they would hear that voice. In this moment, they would feel that presence in their heart. That it's, it's not a voice of disappointment or discouragement. It's not, you're not the angry father who, who's mad because the kid didn't clean up their room or didn't do well in their test. That you are just this loving presence that can see into our future and say, man, if you can get this thing figured out with my help, abundance, blessing, goodness is coming. Not that we won't have difficulty, but your goodness is coming. So Lord, I pray for myself here. I pray that you find me faithful in making choices that honor you with my time. Not just how I spend my days or how I spend my minutes, but how I spend this life that you've given me. How I use it for your glory and for your purpose and not my own. And I pray that I would become a much better servant to those around me. And not just people who love you, not just people I agree with, but their only requisite of serving them is their breathing. Because that's exactly what you did. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time. And I pray that you would solidify these things in our heart as we end our time together in song. In your name we pray. Thank you so much for being here today. We hope that you were encouraged and challenged by this message today. Um, we are always so thankful to have you here. You are always welcome to join us either online or in person on Sundays. Hope you guys have a great week.